And a lot of people think that swimming is an individual sport. And in a way it is, because nobody else is getting their selves out of bed at 4.30 in the morning like we did in Lima to get these guys to practice before school. Uh, nobody else stands up on the starting block, even on a relay. You're the one that has to get yourself up on that block and swim every stroke of the race. But if you think of swimming as an individual sport, you're wrong. It's not. It's a team sport. How many of you guys swim on a team? Okay. And that team means something to you. Hopefully, it should. And if it doesn't, something's wrong. But you should feel a desire to want to succeed for yourselves, but you should also feel the desire to want to swim and achieve success for your team and help your teammates. And try to win a team victory if you can. And for most swimmers, winning a team victory is almost more important than winning an individual event. There's no greater example of how a team can affect human performance, in my opinion, than the 1976 men's. Olympic team in Montreal, which I was proudly a, a part of. But I want to paint the picture of the story for you because uh, in those days it was a little different than today. But if preceding the 76 Olympics in the 60s and in the early 70s, the United States truly dominated. Even though we still dominate the sport of swimming in the world, we still win any more medals than any one other country in the world in, in the Olympics. In those days, we were so strong as a country in the United States that we could, could have sent our third or fourth or fifth best swimmer to the Olympics, and he or she might have won. That's how good we were. There was a tremendous amount of competition to make the team. There still is. But when you made the Olympic team, for example, in 1968, which I did for the first time, you knew that most of your competition for a medal was coming from within that team. And over the six weeks we had to train to prepare for the Olympics in Mexico City, which were at altitude and required a longer period of preparation, that team became a non-team. It, it became a, a group of individuals that were fighting, that were antagonistic toward one another, that were condescending. They didn't help each other. They were looking at each other as competitors rather than as teammates. And we went to the Olympics in 68, and although we won our sh a fair share of medals, we could have done much better, I think. And there was one woman there by the name of Katie Ball, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, because on the morning of her event, the 200 breaststroke, she sat on a bench like this with her arms in her, in her face, or her, her face in her hands, crying, because she couldn't get up and swim the 200 breaststroke. And what was so tragic about that was she was eight seconds faster than the second place swimmer in the 200 breaststroke. Her, her world record was eight seconds faster than second, the second fastest time. She was one swimmer who could have fallen off the blocks and won the Olympics, and yet she couldn't get on the start to start the race. And her coach tried to persuade her and she said, no, I can't, I feel alone. I, I don't feel like I'm part of a team, I'm not going to swim, and she didn't. But contrast that to, to 1976, which was eight years later. Now the rest of the world had caught up. The U United States still was very strong in swimming, but we didn't dominate like we did in 68 or 72. There were great swimmers from Japan and, and, uh, and Europe, Germany, Russia primarily, France. There were great swimmers in South America. Australia had gotten much better. And now when Sports Illustrated came out with their predictions of the Olympics, who was going to win, the United States was predicted to win the men's team, probably half of the medals that were out there for swimming. Pretty dominating performance if we were to live up to that expectation. So we went to the trials in Long Beach, California, and um, we made the team, and we all got on a bus, and we went to the airport, and the next day we flew to Canton, Ohio for six weeks of training. Now, in those days, there were two colleges, Indiana University and, and uh, University of uh, Southern California, that dominated the men's collegiate swimming. And there wasn't one swimmer on Indiana or USC that had any love for the other swimmers on the other team. It was an intense rivalry, to say the least. And yet, 
we were so strong as teams that about half of the U.S. Olympic team was made up of swimmers from Indiana or swimmers from USC, which could have been a recipe for disaster. So on the first day of our team congregation in Canton, two, two co-captains were elected. I was one, and I was from Indiana. And the other was a guy named Steve Furness, who was from Southern California, USC. And one of the reasons we were elected co-captains is that everybody knew that Steve and I were the two swimmers that, from the two different schools that could get along with each other because we swam on the same club in the summertime. So it was a good political move. So Steve and I got together and we said, look, we better stop this rivalry between these schools in the bud. Let's, let's have a team meeting. We did. And we talked to the team. We said, look, we're not going to be allowed for the next six weeks to wear an Indiana shirt. We're not going to be allowed to wear a USC shirt or, or Stanford or Yale or Texas or any other school. We're going to send those home. We're all going to wear one shirt and it's going to say United States of America because that's the team we represent now. We're all members of the same team. And everybody there bought into it. We all believe that now, in spite of the rivalries of our collegiate career, that we could come together and be a, a, a strong team. And while we were meeting, our coaches were meeting, and our head coach, a guy named Doc Councilman, met with the two assistants, Don Gambrell and George Haynes, who both were, had been Olympic, head Olympic coaches in the past, or were capable of being the head coach. And he said, look, we're not gonna, I'm not going to be the head coach. We're going to have three head coaches. George, Don, Doc, we're all three different, we're all three coaches, we're all three great coaches, so we're going to divide our team of 25 swimmers into three groups. And Doc coached the IMers and the breaststrokers because that was his strength, and George Haynes coached the, the, the uh, backstrokers and the uh, middle distance freestylers, and Don Gamble coached the flyers and the sprinters. They, that was their strength. And if any swimmer said, look, I don't, wanna, I don't feel comfortable training with Don or George, they could switch if they wanted to, but nobody did. We all felt good about the choices we had. And now instead of 25 of us swimming for one head coach with two assistants behind him, we each had three little teams that were training with one coach. And the attention we got from that coach was tremendous. So what happened was we had a tremendous training camp where we really united and came together. And so on the last day we headed up to Montreal and as swimming is the first week of the Olympic competition. There's the opening ceremony and the next day the swimming begins. 